Good morning, church. And happy Sabbath. The joy is mine this morning to extend the welcome to our service today at the Emmanuel Seventh-day Adventist Church. I looked out and man, we're looking beautiful. And I'm pretty sure there is a blessing in store for each and every one of us that are present here this day. I know for a fact that us being here is not by chance. It's by divine intervention. It was so set that this day in history that you will be present at the Emmanuel Seventh-day Adventist Church worship with us. I want to say ex uh, a very special and warm welcome to our pastor and his family. But pastor Hart Castle, we welcome you. We're happy to see you. Uh, I also want to welcome uh, Pastor Bernard and Sister Bernard as they're worshiping with us today. And man, there seems to be so many visitors here this morning. I wouldn't have time to ask you to say where you're from. But I know that the Lord, the Holy Spirit, recognize your presence. And so this morning, I just want you to shake, put a wave. Let us recognize that you're visiting with us. And that the Lord will keep you in, in perfect peace as you worship and have an experience of heaven today. I also want to welcome my, my brother here. Um, I do not know your name, but I'm pretty sure later I will know your name. And those of our members, we would not have this worship without you. Amen. Week after week you come, and it is not taken for granted. So keep coming, keep supporting, and we pray that today will be a blessing and a day never to forget. At this time, we'll go around and we'll greet our visiting friends by singing the song, Let Us Greet Somebody, in Jesus' name. so many visitors and members this morning we are happy to see you all this morning it's a good setting and I know heaven rejoice this morning as we worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness today I must say welcome to everyone and every visitor and the behalf of the Emmanuel Seventh-day Adventist Church I wish you a happy and prosperous Sabbath as we go into worship today. And to our pastor, we welcome you back home. <laughs> we just want to welcome him back home because he was here with us many years. So it's just a welcome coming home back to his people. Um, for tomorrow morning, I, it is 10 o'clock, the breakfast, please. We are sorry for that. Officers meeting, 10 o'clock. Amen? We thank you. Um, brother Robert's brother, he will be leaving tomorrow back to Jamaica. Is it tomorrow? Is it tomorrow? The Williams family, sorry. Phillips. Phillips family. They will be leaving to Jamaica tomorrow morning. Let us pray for them as they leave us. They spend quite a few Sabbath with us. And we were happy to have you with us. Amen. May the Lord continue to be with us as we continue to worship. Let us worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness that when he comes, we will meet together. Amen. This is a special time of the day. Which I'm very happy and privileged this morning to do. This is something that I have long waited for. And I think all of us as member of the Manuel Church, we are happy. We are happy for this moment, this morning, as we welcome our newly passed. Many of us had not known. Many of us. I've not known him, but we'll see the quality of person today who he is. The wonderful family. He and his families are here, and we are happy. 
to have them. A service of consecration for Pastor Hardcastle and his family. As the Lord calls you to take up your mantle at Emmanuel Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this the 27th day of August 2016, I am happy to welcome you and your family. I can tell you that this is a great challenge and responsibility, but with Christ in the vessel, he will smile at the storm. It was a challenge as God called Moses to lead the children out of Egypt. It was a challenge for Jeremiah. The Lord called Jeremiah to go speak. Jeremiah say, I am a child. I cannot speak. But the Lord put his hands on Jeremiah's mouth, touched his mouth, and the Lord said unto him, I have put my word in your mouth. He is the same God today. Pastor, just keep your hands in the hands of the Lord, and he will see you true. It was a close walk that Noah had with God made him righteous. Noah still stands as an example of the kind of person God wants to use. God has not changed. It is not necessarily the person with the most skill talent or social standing, but the one who hears the voice and follow his lead. With a wonderful wife beside you, God will see you true, and may his blessing continue to be upon you. Thank you. Good morning, Emmanuel Seventh-day Adventist Church. It is indeed a pleasure to worship with you today. And to, on behalf of uh, the Florida Conference Ministerial Department, introduce someone very familiar to some, many of you, uh, Pastor Claude Hardcastle, and uh, to welcome his lovely wife, Martina, and Benjamin, and Joshua, and Sabraya. Welcome to the Emmanuel Church. Would you like to affirm them? How do you affirm here? Do you clap or praise the Lord? How do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> There are only two people that I'm aware of that came back to serve their former congregation. One of them, his name was Bill, and um, I, I knew him when I was back in college, and he was called back to one of the largest churches in North America. And the other person is Moses, <laughs> when he came back for his people. <laughs> and now there's a third, my brother. <laughs> Welcome back to the Emmanuel Seventh day Adventist Church. I'd like to share just a few thoughts about the call of ministry. Pastors have three responsibilities that it's important for them to pay close attention to. The very first responsibility is to be faithful to Jesus. It is vital that a pastor walk faithfully with Jesus every day. The enemy would attack a pastor left, right, and in between, upside down and, and around him. It's very important for a pastor to stay close to Jesus. In order for that to happen, the pastor needs to spend quality time with the Lord. Every day, every week, he needs to be in prayer. He needs to be active. He needs to be healthy. He needs to be strong. He needs to be taking care of himself personally, emotionally, spiritually, and in every way. And so we encourage pastors to take quality time with Jesus. In fact, our department encourages pastors to take one day a month even, not as a vacation day, but as a personal retreat day, to rebuild himself and to take some time to hear the word of the Lord and to be renewed. I say this to you because you are an important part of encouraging him to maintain that walk with Jesus. He knows he needs the Lord. As Claude and I prayed together in his office this morning, it was evident that he depends 100% on Jesus for what happens here in this pulpit and in your boardroom. 
And so we want to be lifting him up in prayer. The second responsibility that a pastor has is to his family, to his wife and to his children in that order. And it's important for them to have a sense of a sphere of sacredness in their home. The pastor wants to protect his family and encourage them and bless them and, and nurture them in every way possible. And while a pastor does not want his family to be unique or any more special than any other family in the church, he definitely wants to maintain his family's faithfulness and love before Jesus. What I know as a pastor, I have two children, 20 and 16, and I know how the enemy wants to distract them. And there are things that happen in a ministerial home you'd never imagine would happen until you're in the middle of it. Uh, and it's for this reason that we want to pray for our, our pastor and their family, right? Well, the third responsibility a pastor has is to his congregation. In order to serve a congregation faithfully, he must know his congregation. He looks forward to visiting with you and getting acquainted, to building a mission and a conversation around Jesus' calling of faithfulness, what it means to make disciples, what it means to worship, what it means to serve a community. For you see, when a pastor is called to serve a congregation, he's called to have that congregation labor with him for the people all around this city, all around this area. It's a partnership of faith. Here's what I know about your pastor. He will dedicate your children to the Lord. He will baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When the time is right, he will marry them at the altar of God. He will serve the parents the best he can. And he will sometimes lay your loved ones in the grave. A pastor is also a counselor. A pastor will listen to things that are heartbreaking. And sometimes your pastor will carry burdens upon his heart that no one will ever know about because of the confidentiality that he holds to that individual. And it's for reasons like this that it's important that we gather as a church to pray for Pastor Claude and his family. And I would like to invite the elders to come forward. And we're going to meet right over here with Pastor Claude and Martina and their children. And I would like you to remain seated there, but if our elders and any retired pastors, if you're present, would you join us here as we surround this family as Elder McMain will pray a prayer of blessing on their behalf. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, great is thy name and greatly to be praised. We want to say thank you, Lord, for the invitation that you have given to us to enter into your house where your honor dwells. We want to say thank you, Lord, for your blessing that you have blessed us with. We want to say thank you for your grace and for your mercies. We, thy children, gather this morning, not because we want to be here, Lord, but because you invite us to be here. This is a very special and great occasion. And we are so thankful, Lord, for the occasion. We thank you for the great things that you have done for us and still doing for us today. We come now, Lord. We ask your presence here with us now. And that you will consecrate each one of us heart this morning. And that you will cleanse us from all sin and unrighteousness. We thank you to know that you are God who heals, Lord, even the broken, Lord, you can mend them again. God, we have been in Emmanuel. It's a great struggle, but thanks be to God, there is victory. 
And so this morning we are grateful that you have seen the way and the time, Lord. You are God of time. And there's nothing that you've done that is not on time. And so we thank you this morning, Lord, for you have chosen the one to come into Emmanuel Church to stand as a beacon of light. Give us a heart of love. Give us a heart of respect. Give us a heart of peace. A heart to honor you, God, knowing that you know us, Lord. And you know what we stand in need of. And so, God, you grant us according to the desire of our heart. We pray this morning, Lord, for the one you have chosen to lead your church. We place him into your hand. We ask you this morning, dear God, to consecrate him afresh for your service. He have been serving you, Lord. But this is a special time of his life. When he has to stand up before you, Lord, and declare who you are to your people. And so, God, we thank you for what you have done for him. It's always been a struggle, but God, you promised to take us through. And so we pray for his family this morning. We pray for his wife as she stand by his side. Lord, that she too will stand as a beacon of light. We pray for the children this morning also, Lord. We are living in the last days when the enemy is targeting the young people. But God, we commend them into your care and your hand this morning. We beg you to hoof over them your Holy Spirit. And we pray, Lord, that as we worship, Lord, our worship will be accepted. We pray, Lord, for those who come in to visit this morning. We pray that your Holy Spirit will take control of each heart and mind. We pray for every leaders this morning, every officers in Emmanuel Church, that a great change will wrought in this congregation as we lift up the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for being here with us over the years, Lord. We thank you, and this morning is a special thank you for the great things you have done for Emmanuel. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. And I know, Lord, this morning, your angels surround us, Lord, to take back the great message to heaven. Lord, may we have peace. Lord, may the power of the Holy Spirit empower us today as we listen to your manservant. Bless this family in a special way. Bless Emmanuel congregation. And all those who come through that door, may the Holy Spirit saturate each heart we pray. And we say thank you. We pray for the general conference this morning. We pray, Lord, for those in, that is in trust with your words. We pray them up because there is trouble everywhere. But we seek your face, Lord. We thank you this morning. We give glory and honor and praise to you for the great things you have done and still doing and about to do. We say thank you in Jesus' name. For our call to worship today, we will recite or read together Psalms 100. And to affirm our faith, we will do Exodus 20, 8 through 11, and John 3, 16. First, Psalms 100. 
Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye land. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and praise his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Exodus 28 through 11. Remember the seventh day to keep it holy. Six days shall thy labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy counter, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth the sea and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. To you, dear God, be the glory forever. To you, dear God, be our love forever. To you, dear God, be our service forever. To you, dear God, be our worship forever. We thank you for inviting us to come before your presence and to tabernacle a while, move through these pews, stop at each heart, answer the questions that are being asked, and may Jesus be known, seen, heard, and felt today. For we wait in anticipation in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Most of you know me because I grew up in this church, but if you don't, my name is Natasha. This is Jordan and this is Calvin. They're my brothers. So, I just wanted to say that even though I haven't been in this specific church for a while, that I haven't forgot about God. In fact, the name of our group is The Promise simply because we haven't forgotten about God's promise to us. And we want to remind those who have forgotten that he's still out there and he does not go back on his promises Amen. so i just wanted to say thank you for allowing us to come and sing to you guys today and i hope that our music will be a ministry to you all praises be to the king of kings and the lord our God, He is wonderful. All praises be to the King of kings and the Lord. Our God, He is wonderful. All praises be to the King of kings and the Lord our God he is wonderful all praises be to the king of kings and the Lord our God he is wonderful all praises Salvation of kings and the Lord, our God, He is wonderful. All praise be to the salvation and glory and the honor and power. He is wonderful. He is exalted. 
The King is exalted, and I, I will praise Him. He is exalted, the King is exalted, and I will praise His name. He is the Lord forever. His holy name. He is exalted. The King is exalted on I surrender all. I surrender all to Savior, I surrender all. Lord, I will lift mine eyes to the hills. Lowing my blessing and it's my first baby blessing as your new pastor I'm officially installed now right I'm gonna ask Marvin and Kiriana to bring up Madison and Milani if you have family and friends who have come with you today they may be present as well Come on, Madison. This is Milani. Okay, you hold her, not, not just yet. Now, Madison, we had a talk. Do you remember? Okay. This is a sacred and blessed thing that you, Marvin and Kiriana, have decided to do. If, there, if you are attached to, to them in any way, I know Brother Brown is the godfather. You have a, you have a huge responsibility, sir. But not as much as the parents. We had an opportunity, church family, you should know. I visited with them and we talked. And I think it's important that 
As parents make a decision to dedicate and offer their children back to the Lord, that they understand what that means and what is about to take place today. So there's no need to go through that again, but as you see before you and next to you, you have people that love you, concerned about you, and will be there to support as we watch Madison and Milani grow up to be young individuals who express their own personality, who would develop and make decisions, some good, not some not so good. But as parents, God has given us the awesome responsibility to be guides for our children, to lead them to the Lord, and at the same time respecting the gift of free will, of free choice that God gives to us. And that is somewhat sacred and sometimes risky it can seem because we don't always make the best decisions. But God will be there to walk with you and to guide you as long as you trust him and bring all your cares and concerns to him. It's your responsibility to pray for these, these children. Pray for their safety. Pray for their salvation. Pray that they will grow up having the desire to know who Jesus is for themselves personally and to say yes to the Lord. Our expectation today is that after this dedication, as we church family also support and live a Christ-centered, dedicated life to Jesus, that they would one day make a decision to join the church and say yes to Jesus and be baptized. That is our hope and expectation. And by God's grace, we will do that, live our lives so committed that others will see why Jesus is important. So, Brother Brown, I'm going to ask you to stand next to me because I'm, you'll take Madison. If, if she'll cooperate, will you go to Grandma? All right. You got that touch, man. You got that touch. Yes. Oh, I forgot you were here. Okay. Church family, I'm going to ask those who commit themselves to living your life in such a way to be a support for the family, to be a witness to these young girls as they grow up, to stand in support as we pray and dedicate these dear girls to the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, this is a sacred moment, not to be forgotten or overlooked, because there will come that day where these children, these girls, will grow up and the parents will forget that this day has ever happened. But I pray, Lord, that you your spirit by the people who profess to love you will help Mar uh, Marvin and Kiriana to so turn to you when they are in need of help so to turn to you even when their baskets are full when there's no need of anything and when there's plenty want that they turn to you every moment giving you thanks giving you praise, putting you first, so that these dear children may see what it means and what it looks like to love the Lord first and best. Lord, I'm asking you to take them like only you can. We can only do so much, but you promise, Father, to be there for us as we love and nurture and cherish and grow up these young ladies. Bless their home. 
Lord, there's coming a time where we want them to make a decision for you, to say yes to Jesus. Lord, but you know, you know what distractions will come into their lives. You know how the devil will try to keep them, Lord, away from you. But your grace and your power are stronger than that. Your grace, your word are stronger than that. Your blood is stronger than that. Your love is deeper and stronger than that. So may that be felt. May that be the motivation and pulse of their life. Please bless them. Please favor them. Please protect them. Thank you for them. We return them to you today in Christ's holy name. Amen and amen. Have something for you their certificates and something for Madison As we stand for our scripture reading for today, which is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 12. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 12. Let us stand, please. We will read together. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, shalt talk to them when thou sittest, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be a frontlet between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gate. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he swore unto thy father, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells dig which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full. T together on verse 12, Then beware, lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding and application of his word. You may be seated. There are so many things happening in our world. So many things are happening. I, I can just men mention only a few. Like we have just blessed two babies coming into the world. And presently, Brother Buck over here is mourning for the loss of his sister. And in between, there are those of us who are rejoicing over something or the other. And in the, mid, in, the, in the midst of it all, we are still mourning over something or the other. I often say that as a Christian, we are either going to a battle or we are coming out of one. 
but we are never at all neutral. We got to keep going. Something is happening. One pastor told me some time ago, he says, he's off the scene, he said, never to never be too happy and never be too sad. The moment you are too happy and joyful, look out, the devil is coming with something to break you down. When you get down to the lowest, you might want to give up. But there's something to build you back up. And so let us, as God, speak to our hearts. Just keep that touch with him. Keep that touch with him. But about presently, he's not even feeling too well. While he's mourning the loss of his sister. And so this morning, we are going to pray. It's prayer time. And if it's even by the book alone, I would like him to just join with me so I can embrace him as we pray that special prayer. He wants to come. We're going to pray together at this time. And I'm sure that God in his own good time and way will do the work that is to be done for each of us is willing able and available let's bow together on our knees knowing that earth doesn't have any sorrow that heaven cannot heal. Let us pray. Eternal Father, our loving God, Father of the human race, creator of heaven and earth, and everything in between. In the quietude of this midday, our Heavenly Father, we come bowing before your loving presence. Knowing that you are a loving God, a prayer hearing God, a forgiving God, a long suffering God patient you are and so we come to you heavenly father with our weaknesses with our sorrows with our cares with our burdens they are lifted at calvary but we thank you heavenly father that jesus is very near now the great physician is here he speaks the drooping heart to cheer. Oh, hear the voice of Jesus. We come to you, God. We come to you this morning. Knowing that earth doesn't have any problems. That heaven cannot cure. Earth doesn't have no sorrows. That heaven doesn't see. Sometimes we wonder, oh, far is God? And we even ask, God, where are you? But with smiling face, Father, and with faith we look to you, and we can see you giving a smile to your children. You are right here beside me. I'm only a breath away. And so we thank you, God, that you are here even now with us. Because you have declared that this house is your house. It's a house of prayer for all people. And so we are thankful that you bid us to come into your house to worship and adore your name. And so we are thankful, God, that you are here with us today to give a listening ear to our cry and to minister to our needs as only you alone knows how. 
in a very special way, you want to place Brother Buck who is contemplating even surgery. That you will be with him. You will guide him. You will protect him. And you will help Heavenly Father that those doctors will do the work that you allow them to do. And that he will be recovered at your command to praise and to glorify your name. Ask God that you will be with his extended family members who are mourning the lost. He's not mourning the loss of his sister. And the rest of the family are mourning with him. Pray God that you'll just be with them in a very special way. It's a tough situation. But God, you are always there to comfort and to care for your people. There are many of us who are going through trials and difficulties even in this room right now. But Father in heaven, we are thankful that you never leave us nor forsake us because you are God and you promise and your promises are sure and stand fast forever. Help us, dear Father, to trust you for who you are. We ask that you will be with these your waiting people as we come together to worship you today. Father, this is the moment that we have been long waiting for. It is your time. And Father, we are waiting on you to speak to our hearts. This world is in trouble. We are thankful, God, that if we just place our trembling hands in yours, you will lead us unto that perfect end when you will come to take your people from this sin-cursed earth to be with you in your eternal kingdom. And so, Father, today, today, God, we humble ourselves. We anticipate a word from you. We are thankful that you have, in your good time and way, provided a manservant. And you have given him a message for the hour. You have been preparing him for weeks and months. Today, you have brought him safely here to be used by you to minister to your children. He is standing, dear Father, in the gap. And he is now meditating on your goodness. You have come this far by faith, leaning on your everlasting arms. By trusting in you, Father, we'll know that safely you will lead him to the place where you want him to be so he can lead your people in a time like this to present them to you at your coming. We pray, God, that the message you have presented to him, Pastor Art Castle, today to bring to your children that, dear God, if there's anything in it that is not fitting, that you will discard it. And you will fit and prepare him, God, to speak the words that you will have him speak so that your children in turn can be blessed by what he say. And we can leave this place rejoicing in you. There's somebody here today, God, who need to hear something for the saving of their souls. Pray, God, that you will just do the work through your man's servant that is to be done so your name can be praised, be honored, and be glorified. Pray, God, that you'll be with his family in a very special way. His wife and children, extended family members, wherever they may be. God, I pray that you'll continue to be with the young man. And help that as he opens his mouth today to speak for you, you will speak through him that our hearts will be blessed. Thank you so much for bringing us together in your house of worship. May we continue to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father in heaven, when it pleases you to come, we pray, God, you'll prepare us for your coming because we know you are coming prepare us for your coming so you can take us home to live with you forever and forever may this be our desire to wait at your feet and to wait for your soon return as we tell you thanks for hearing and for answering our prayer today in all our circumstances dear father please have your own sweet way because we bless and honor your name and tell you thanks for hearing and answering us in jesus name
Happy Sabbath, everybody. I do not know where you are right now. I am not sure. But I want to say this. If you're on the mountain, be sure that your valley is coming. And if you're in the valley, be sure that your mountain is coming. So if you're in the valley, pray for those on the mountain. And if you're on the mountain, pray for those who are in the valley. Because God, just as our God is with the one on the mountain, he will be with you as well in the valley. Sister Green, to remind us that God is with us. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So love he the world that he gave us his son. I'm going through a batch and barrel of emotions up here this afternoon because who would have ever thought, surely not I, 
Elder Sippy. But God knows what he's doing. Yes. Natasha, you and your group, thank you for that song. You showed up today and reminded me of how old I'm getting. <laughs> but it's good to see all of the Forbes family and many other families that seven, six, seven years ago, we departed from here on faith. Knew where we were heading, but not know we were, where we would land. One thing, church family, guest visitors, that I am very passionate about is God. And giving him the rightful place that he belongs in the lives of humanity. Because we were all made in his image and in his likeness. And sin has marred us and disfigured us in such terrible ways to cause us to say this group of people is better than this group of people, but we are all made in God's image and in his likeness. And you will discover as we worship and work and fellowship together that I'm passionate about humanity and God's purpose for humanity. And we'll, you'll discover that more and more. I'm aware of the time and you should not be. So let me deal with the clock myself. I know Pastor Baptiste is in the congregation today, as well as Pastor Bernard and his wife. Nineteen ninety six, Pastor Baptiste baptized me. He probably doesn't remember. And then I believe it's two thousand and eight or nine. I rededicated my life and Pastor Bernard rebaptized me. There's some significant things that happen in each of our lives. And if we slow down just a little bit to pay attention to the story that God is writing, we'll see that he is the God of the mountain and in the valley. And he's concerned about everything that concerns each and every one of us. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on God. I want to thank this morning Elder Tim Goff, <clears throat> excuse me, Ministerial Field Associate for Florida Conference for being here. I know your wife could not be here with us, but please again send her our regards. Even though he is here to reintroduce me, um, the church should know that he has made himself available to help my family and I with the transition from South Florida where we've been for the last four years. And I thank you for the little things that you have done. They mean a lot. Thank you for being here. I do wanna thank also the leadership of Florida Conference specifically Elder Tim Nichols, who is our ministerial director, for giving me the opportunity to come back and continue to use the gifts God has given me here at Emmanuel. And by the way, if, if you have not figured it out yet or have not heard, you are sharing me with another church. So don't be jealous. I was installed there at Windermere last week. We had a good time in the Lord. 
You know, it's humbling to see how the Lord moves on the hearts of men and women. And I, I am convinced this afternoon that when it comes to pastoral assignments and reassignments, that the ministerial team of the conference, they give thoughtful and prayerful consideration on the needs of the congregation and the needs of the family. And I thank God for them. We should be lifting them up in prayer because a lot of times they have decisions to make of magnitudes that we know nothing about. Let's continue to lift them up in prayer. I want you to know too that my family and I are confident that when you just wait on the Lord, he'll work it out. He'll work it out. If not in your generation, in the generation to come, he'll work it out. You see, before we left six years ago, our dear Elder Joseph Dawkins, who passed away, said to me, he said, Elder, God may just bring you back here to be the pastor. And before that, too, even Pastor Bernard, if anybody remembers, affirmed and, and asked the congregation to accept me as your, as your pastor when I served underneath him. And I, I still consider you my mentor. Thank you for all that you've poured into me and allowing me to watch how you did ministry. It makes a difference. There's no, there's no, there's very few men like Pastor Bernard. And I thank God for you and your dear wife. Thank you. But see, Elder Dawkins said, God may bring you back here to, and you know, he had that deep voice. God may bring you back here to be the pastor. And I tell you, I was short-sighted then because I received his, his comments twofold. I, uh, it occurred to me that it was, a, okay, a, prophet, a, a prophetic proclamation that was one side of it, and the other side of it in my mind, I was like, you must be crazy. <laughs> Me? Me? If only he were alive today to see this. And also, Elder Conrad Duncan and his family, they were also there very instrumental in praying for us and encouraging, with, encouraging us, and I, I thank him and his family as well for what they have done. Church, I believe that there is a humanitarian crisis happening all across the globe. And if any other group of people were to give clarity and truth to the problems that humans face, I believe it should be Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Why? Because we understand and we teach that all of humanity has been infected with the disease of rebellion, selfishness, and distrust towards God. And we understand that through the biblical narrative and the spirit of prophecy that God himself provides a remedy free for the taking to all who would accept it. I believe these are the closing days of the curse of sin. And it's evident that God's love wins. Oh, you didn't get that. You don't understand that. God's love wins the battle for our eternal life. Matter of fact, his love has already won. I want the church to know also that as a pastor, I will support the conference's program. I will minister to all people, young and old. I do not do clicks or anything resembling clicks. By God's grace, I will always be impartial. I want you to know, too, that I am available, I am accessible, and I am approachable. Available, accessible, and approachable. I believe my number is in the bulletin, but I can be reached there. That's the best way to reach me. Email address, if you want it, will come later. I hope you will feel comfortable in coming to me. I also believe in ministerial ethics. 
ethics and professionalism with a high level of confidentiality Amen. along with integrity. I have a good working, growing, loving relationship with my family. And we are committed to each other and committed to living the Christian life at home first. Learning what it means to follow Jesus in our homes. Conference has sent me here to be a leader. And they want me to be successful. And by the grace of God, we will be successful. We will. I also believe, want you to know in democratic leadership. I believe in democratic leadership. I'm open to the ideas that you may have and I'm willing to listen to other perspectives on ways to stay on the mission, to stay on task. Okay? Can't believe it's that time. That clock is broken, right? Let's pray. <clears throat> God, my Father, our Father, for a few moments, for a few moments, right now, speak to your people, speak to your people, show us what to do, what to know, what to believe. Thank you for your promise, your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Faith at home. Faith at home. If you have, you do have your Bibles, let it rest on Deuteronomy chapter 6, please. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Faith at home. In my time serving as a youth pastor, I've discovered that there is one consistent factor present among the reasons why young people become disengaged and disconnected from the church and its programs. See, as soon as they're able to obtain a little freedom by either getting their driver's license or having a friend that, can ha that gets their driver's license, their planning begins. They start to explore solutions to the problem they think is the cause for their unhappiness. The question of how can I find a way to stop attending my parents' church? That question is usually the catalyst leading many young people who turn into young adults who want little to nothing to do with the church. Research has shown that 60 to 90 percent of children enrolled in church programs are going to disengage from their faith when they become young adults. Now, that is a critical problem. The primary reason for their disengagement is hypocrisy. Research shows us hypocrisy. It's not what you think, though. It's not hypocrisy in the church or at the worship hour, no, rather it's hypocrisy at home, at home. You see, the lies that we profess in the presence of each other and the lies that we actually live at home look, as one Christian author has put it, look to be unchristian. The lies that we profess, the lies that we live, look to be unchristian. And this is what young people are saying too. Christians are supposed to represent Christ to the world. But our report card, if one were taken, our report card would show that we are failing terribly. And something is terribly wrong. When surveys were taken back in 2007 by a Christian research group of how Christians viewed how Christianity was viewed from the outside terms like quoting insensitive judgmental 
and hypocritical were used to describe Christianity from the outside. But Christians are supposed to represent Christ to the world. This negative perception has an impact on how much leverage we have when talking with our neighbors, when talking with strangers, or even with family members on why Jesus is important, and Jesus is important. I believe that of all the programs, all the ministries and departments that we operate, making the connection how, of how faith in Christ transforms the lifestyle habits at home should be every believer's business. Faith in Christ, transforming us at home first, should be everybody's business. You know, Satan is busy and has been working in subtle and almost undetectable ways on our homes. He knows, brothers and sisters, that what happens in the home is more influential on forming a firm faith than what happens in church on Sabbath especially for the next generation of Christ followers. God is requiring parents to return to their rightful place as faith builders in their homes. Parents need to be strong and courageous and take back the responsibility of setting the trajectory of our children, how they will function in this world and their purpose. We may not always get it right, but we need to try. Be strong and be courageous. One title of a book said, Parenting is not for cowards. Oh, how true it is. I was reminded of that just this morning. Lord, help me. But I will be strong and I'll be courageous because Jesus matters. You see, as fragmented and disconnected as many families are, it is not an easy task to bring Christ and Christ-like living back into our homes. It's not easy. I dare say it will not even be enjoyable at first, for there are many habits to unlearn, to be corrected. But with God, all things are possible. James 4, 6 says he resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. If we humble ourselves before the Lord, we can do it by his help. Believers are to what? Submit to God and resist the devil. And when we resist the devil, when we submit to God and resist the devil, he has to flee. There's no invitation. Don't send an invitation. Don't set up an open way for the devil to get in your home in any way and have an influence over your children, parents, that we should have. Be strong and be courageous. The devil will have to flee. I believe he will have to flee when parents grandparents and step parents and adoptive parents and whoever other parents you may be when we take up our rightful place as faith builders the devil will have to flee you see the promise is and i love this passage the promise is james 4 and verse 8 says draw near to god and he will draw near to you God has given us command. Look, going back to our scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 6, God has given us command. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your what? Heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. When the Bible directs us to love God first and best, it is really for our benefit. Hello, somebody. When God directs us and commands us to love him first and best, it's for our benefit, not for him. God is love. He is love to give. He's complete all in himself. He's just that awesome. He's just that God. But this is for our benefit. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. 
let these words be in your heart. In order for us to love God, we've got to see the truth about God. In order for us to love him, we got to see the truth about him. And when we begin, when we begin to understand his attitude towards us, we'll begin to desire him more. The affections for him will be deeper and our inclinations towards him will be intimate. You ever had a girl or a guy that you liked when you were younger? Or if you're married and you see your spouse? And they still do something toward for you. You know, your heart kind of skips a beat or you get butterflies in your stomach. It's like that. When you think about all that the Lord has done for you and for us. And how passionate he is for each and every one of us. Young people, God is passionate about you. He is. He has a plan and a desire for you. And when you fall in love with God. Even though we will make mistakes, even though we'll try to figure it out, but when you fall in love with God, it's like you're not ashamed to say it. Amen. No, young man, I can't go there. I love God. Amen. No, young lady, I will not do that. I love God. Amen. No, friends, we ain't going. Well, I'm not going to do that. I love God. Loving God first and best. So the text says, beginning at verse, looking at verse six, he says, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Verse seven, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Verse 10. So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build. Hello, somebody. Houses full of good things which you did not fill. Hello, somebody. Hewn out of wells which you did not dig. Hello, somebody. Vineyards and olive, tree, olive trees which you did not plant. Hello, somebody. When you have eaten and are full. Verse 12. Then beware lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You want good things? You want nice things? We can acquire good things and nice things sometimes, but not put God first. And those things will turn into termites and moths and there'll be a burden for us. But when you put God first, God gives you those things. God says, I get you didn't do that. I did it. Just put me first. Faith at home. It starts at home. Let me get to my sermon before I let me get to my notes. Let me get to my notes. Let me get to my notes. Faith at home is where it all begins. You see, my job, my responsibility as your pastor is to help you establish what it means to live out the Christian life at home so that you and your children and your grandchildren will not see Christianity as hypocritical, but authentic Holy Spirit power transformation through the faith, through faith in Jesus Christ. I'm about to shock you with something. Listen, listen. It is not the church's primary responsibility to teach your children faith. It is not the Sabbath school department's respons primary responsibility to teach your children faith. It is not the AYS primary responsibility to teach your children faith. Faith begins at home. At home. Deuteronomy chapter 6. The church and its ministries are to support you as the spiritual leader in the home. The church is supposed to partner with you. Partner with you. Not replace you in telling God's story. Let that sink in. 
Beloved, the church is here to support and partner, not replace. Turn to Psalm 78, verse 5. Psalm 78, verse 5. One of my favorite passages of the Psalms. The psalmist says in verse 5. For he has established a testimony in Jacob. And appointed a law in Israel. Which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. That the generation to come might know them. The children who would be born. They ain't born yet. Who would be born that they may arise and declare them to their children. Listen, that they may set their hope in God. That they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. We are living in a time that is so confusing. And I'll have a, I have a sermon that I'm going to share with you in the coming weeks. How technology, specifically the internet, has so hyperlinked our lives. That we're living hyperlinked lives. And I'm not knocking or bashing the internet. It's a great tool. But too many times or too often we have allowed it to replace sacred things in our lives. I'm talking to Christians, yes? Am I talking to believers? Yes? Believers in Jesus, yes? When we have more faith in a search engine than we do in the one who searches our hearts, there are some recommitments that need to happen. That they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. I'm going to be kind to you this morning. I'm going to give you some things that I want you to write down. When I say write it down, it's important, right? So write this down. There are three steps I want to give you today that can help parents return to their rightful place as, as, as bishops and priests and apostles and disciple makers in your home. Three steps. Step one. What step? Step one. Very simple. Teach and explore the principles of God's kingdom at home. Teach and explore the principles of God's kingdom at home. Read the Bible as a family and engage in conversation. Ask questions. Allow questions to be asked. Present different scenarios. Help their minds to learn how to think critically about the wisdom that is contained in the Bible. Does that make sense? The Bible is God's book to us. Now, as you begin this first step, keep an open mind to communicate in ways that, peep, that the children understand. Communicate in ways and language that we can all understand. Be relevant is what I'm saying. Allow them to ask questions that they don't yet understand and dare we not take the position to assume that because they come to church on Saturday or Sabbath and go to Sabbath school class, that they should know. Children are a heritage of the Lord. And they are trying to figure out this big, confusing world. Let us not take the position to assume or neglect that they should already know. Let us nurture and explore God's purposes for humanity. Step one. Step two. 
one of my favorite things. Engage in worship and praise to God at home. Don't just wait for Sabbath morning. Engage in worship and praise to God at home. Practice being thankful. Somebody say amen. amen. Practice being thankful. You see, I found that thankfulness to the Lord can protect one from losing their mind. Can I, y'all have a witness? Thankfulness. Lord, I thank you for saving a wretch. I thank you for keeping me from that situation. It can keep you from losing your mind. I found in the writing, in writing to the believers in Rome, the Apostle Paul gives the most accurate picture of what happens to, listen to this, the most accurate picture of what happens to humanity when ungratefulness is present in the life. Romans 1, and beginning with verse 20, and I'm going to read from a paraphrase. You got to listen very closely. Paul says, From the very moment that the earth was created, God's true self has been created constantly revealed his eternal life-giving power his loving nature his respect for freedom and his methods of gracious giving his character is seen in everything he has made so that humans are not left in darkness and have no excuse for remaining in their terminal state verse 21 for although they knew the truth about God and his methods, they did not appreciate his gracious, humble character, nor did they honor him by trusting him and incorporating his methods into their lives. Therefore, their reasoning was damaged. Their conscience was seared. Their thoughts became illogical and irrational. And their minds were darkened with lies and falsehoods. They deceived themselves and claimed to be wise, but were actually fools who lost the ability to discern between right and wrong, the healthy from the unhealthy, the true from the false. Verse 23 and so they exchanged the values, methods, and principles of the immortal God for man-made figurines of mortal human, humans, birds, mammals, reptiles. And then we even developed theories that humanity evolved from such lower creatures. Verse 24. Therefore, because they persistently refused the gracious remedy for freely offered, God gave them up to reap the consequences of the unremitting infection of fear and selfishness. Being thankful to God can help you or keep you from losing your mind. It seems that the first step towards disbelief and disconnectedness is an ungrateful heart. And the absence of thankfulness in the life, according to the text. Contrarily, I've gathered it would suffice to say that the first step towards God would be thankfulness and appreciation of who he is. Make sense? God, I thank you for keeping me sane and composed yeah. when that brother or that sister or that situation was testing me I know there's some witnesses in here yeah. God I thank you I thank you first step towards God thankfulness and appreciation for who he is so worship and praise the Lord step one is to explore the Bible, teach its principles about God's kingdom. Step two, <clears throat> step two, engage in worship and praise to God at home. You know, turn on some music. Mu we are rhythmic people. Yes. I only heard one amen. amen. You know, your heartbeat is on a rhythm. Yes. Yeah. You breathe on a rhythm. Yes. Okay. 
Sometimes if you hear a good song, a good gospel song, a good Christian song, your feet get to tapping, your hand gets to uh, uh, clapping, or you, you start to remember, we live in rhythm. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we live in rhythm. Encourage or usher, I should say, set the atmosphere, parents. Not just on Sabbath morning or not just Friday night. Let there be worshipful music and praise at home yes. so that the children begin to have an orientation that Jesus is important. Amen. Because the world, I want to say the world, society right now is saying, do as you love, do what you want. Whatever makes you feel good, do that. Yes. Romans 1.20 or, or chapter 1. 1 through 28, God gave them up. God gave them up. Step three, and I'm closing, finishing with step three. The third step in building faith at home is as a family, get involved in some type of service. Do something for somebody in your community, in your neighborhood. Do something for somebody. Building faith at home. Service, I believe, is the new form of civil disobedience. Hmm, you'll get that later. Seventh-day Adventist Christians are not to be identified by their words or their worship or their praise or by the Sabbath observance only. You see, as we follow Jesus, we see that he desired the good of all he came in contact with. Education, page 143. We know this, this passage very well. Jesus, he mingled with men as one who desired their good. And I thank God for this quarter Sabbath school lesson. I think it's been a long time overdue that we talked about being a church that makes a difference. Not just having the truth. Because if we have the truth, but it's not making a difference in the community where we are, there is a huge disconnect. Be about service. Jesus, mingle with men as one who desire their good. He showed his sympathy for them. He ministered to their needs and then he won their confidence. After he won their confidence, Jesus was able to say, come, follow me. Come, follow me. Come, follow me. And it didn't just happen in a day. It didn't just happen in a week. Jesus mingled with people. You know, and I, I found this. He mingled with them as one who desired their good. And this mingling, this I know has been an issue in our church, Adventist church for a long time, the mingling word. Listen to me as your pastor. Listen to me. Don't mingle if you don't desire their good. Amen. You end up in trouble. Causing confusion. If you desire their good, come next to them. Mingle with them. Listen to them. Ask them questions. But if you don't desire their good, don't mingle. Then Jesus bade them follow me. And she continues. There is a need of us coming close to the people, to the people by personal effort. If less time we're giving to sermonizing, that's why I'm closing. If less time we're giving to sermonizing and more time were spent in personal ministry, greater results would be seen. faith at home. Amen. The church is here to support and come alongside with you as spiritual leader in your home. The excellency that you want to see here, let it be done at home 
And trust me, the overflow of what happens at home will spill over into here. And when we come into this place, we'll do nothing but lift up the name of Jesus. Amen. And we'll be on one accord. And the love will be felt. And we'll be on one purpose, one mission. You understand? And as your pastor, I'm going to be here to support you, parents, grandparents, step-parents, adoptive parents, parent parents, whoever you are, to support you. Establishing faith at home. Now, we'll talk and be real because it's not a perfect thing. Because children will decide for themselves. They have their own mind. We are all individual creatures. But we need to be strong, we need to be courageous, and move forward telling the story of God in our homes. Do you believe the word of God? Stand with me as we pray. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take you at your word. Just to rest upon your promise. Just to know. Thus saith the Lord. You have told us. You have shown us. And I pray that if there's anybody here. That has substituted Lord. Being the leader. Their spiritual leader at home. And expecting the church to disciple and build faith in their children. May they have a little talk with you and repent. Because you require parents to be the builders of their children's faith. Thank you for the blessed people. Thank you for the blessed sermon. Thank you for the blessed time to worship with you today. In Christ's name, amen. Let us pray. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the moment that we have spent in your house, listening to your voice, speaking to us through your manservant. We thank you, Lord, for these words of encouragement, words of wisdom, words of beauty, words of life. And Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be upon our hearts and in our hearts as we receive these words, that we'll go and live them and teach them. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for the speaker of the hour. May you continue to impress upon your heart, his heart your words to your people. And may our heart rejoice as we leave your house. Bless every soul that come through these doors today. And as we separate now, Lord, please be with us for the remaining portion of the day as we pray in Jesus' name.